I know we've already dealt with uh, baptism and Lord's Supper and Luther's catechisms, uh, but he picks up that issue once again here in the Small God Articles. Yes, he does. Um, the sacraments were issues that he felt had to be discussed at the council. And his reservations about medieval uh, views of baptism largely revolved around uh, understandings of the sacrament as a kind of magical thing. And so he says simply, baptism is nothing other than God's word in the water. Um, just a very simple statement of the fact that, as we remember from Luther's uh, small catechism, the water is in this setting of the word, the, the um, command and the promise of God is what's very important. And then he adds um, that we maintain that children should be baptized. And there he gets to the purpose of baptism. For infants as well as for adults, it brings the promised redemption that Christ won for us. And so his statement on baptism is quite simple. And his statement on the Lord's Supper is quite simple, although he goes into more abuses uh, in the case of that next article. Uh, actually, he's talking about people outside the Roman Church when he insists that we teach uh, that children should be baptized so that they can receive Christ's promised redemption. In the case of the Lord's Supper, the abuses that he looks at are within the Roman church. But he begins by saying very simply, the bread and the wine in the supper are truly the body and blood of Christ. Uh, it's a very simple affirmation that in a mysterious way, God has placed the very body and blood of our Lord and Savior in these sacramental elements. And then he adds a, a reinforcement for that view. He says they are not only offered to and received by upright Christians, but also by evil ones. In other words, what he is saying is, against his opponents like Ulrich Zwingli, who said that Christ was at best spiritually present or only symbolized in the bread and the wine. He is saying that Christ's body and blood are conveyed to all who receive because the presence of Christ's body and blood are not dependent on our faith. Receiving the benefits of the sacrament is dependent on our faith. It's not a magical thing. It is this conversation between our God and us in which he calls on us to trust in him. But the presence of Christ's body and blood are dependent upon God's promise, upon the words of institution. They depend upon God's power and not our power in our faith. And so, Luther says, they are offered both to um, the evil people and to uh, those who are upright Christians. The small card article he says, gives us one of the strongest, clearest statements of the real presence and in some ways kind of a touchstone for determining whether the body and blood are present. If one can say that non-Christians receive the body and blood as well as Christians, then it really is emphasizing body and blood is present and distributed whether you believe it or not. Yes, yes. There are actually three lines that Lutherans uh, like to use, and, and two of them are included in this, this uh, statement here. Uh, one is that Christ is sacramentally present. It's a mysterious kind of presence. You can't analyze it uh, through the rules and laws of chemistry or physics, but it's more than just a spiritual presence. It's a miracle of God. Uh, Luther argued uh, on the basis of the way he had learned to practice theology that in his almighty power God could set up any kind of world he wanted to. He was not bound by uh, some rule that says that the material elements of God's creation can't actually convey spiritual blessings. Uh, so he insisted first of all that, that, um, that the body and blood are sacramentally present in a real, genuine, true presence. Uh, then secondly, he uh, emphasized that they are received by unworthy or unbelievers as well as uh, believing uh, Christians. And then thirdly, the phrase that the body and blood are actually received through our mouth mm -hmm. became a kind of test for uh, the Lutheran understanding of the Lord's Supper. You said something about the abuses of the sacrament. Yes. 
Um, then Luther goes on with a little more detail actually to talk about first of all the medieval custom of distributing only the Lord's body, only the mm -hmm. bread uh, to the communicants, probably for pious reasons because it would have been bad if communicants had spilled the blood of Christ. As a matter of fact, sometimes when that happened, uh, those little bits of cloth or, or, or shavings of wood from the uh, altar furniture were taken and used in magical ways by people who thought that the blood of the Lord had uh, special power. Uh, but what had ha actually happened during the course of the Middle Ages was that the fact that the, the laity could not receive Christ's blood in the Lord's Supper was used as a, as a kind of exaltation an unseemly and, and, and uh, misplaced exaltation of the office of the priest over the laity. And so Luther thought that, that the Roman church was practicing a tyranny against the people and against God because Jesus had said, take, eat, take, drink to all the disciples as representatives of the whole church, not just of the clergy. So he insisted that uh, that the Lord's Supper be given in the form of both bread and wine so that the people all could receive body and blood. And then along with that, he criticizes the doctrine of transubstantiation. Not so much because it was a false doctrine. Um, it did claim that Christ's body and blood were present there. But because it was too much explanation, it again was a kind of presumption, human presumption, trying to explain more than scripture explains. It used the uh, physics of Aristotle to, um, to try to explain how Christ could be present. Again, a, a pious reason for introducing the explanation. But Luther said that it, um, it led to some magical practices, actually. And it was just trying to explain what God had left as a mystery. So he insisted to it be left as a mystery. Because in the, in the uh, second section of the small cult articles, Luther had already d discussed the abuse of the concept of the sacrifice of the mass. Um, Luther doesn't treat it here. Can you say something now about the office of the keys? Yes. Uh, then, uh, uh, actually, Luther continues by talking about the office and the authority that Christ has given the church to bind and to loose sins. That is really to exercise the functions of law and gospel. God's word of law that condemns and God's word of gospel that restores so that people will come to repentance. And he goes from a brief treatment of the office of the keys into a longer treatment of the uh, absolution's power to comfort and to help against sin and a bad conscience. And he goes on at, at some length especially in the expansion that he added when this work was published um, a year later to, uh, to talk about the necessity of the word of the Lord coming from outside us to bring that comfort and consolation. If we have to look inside, as some reformers, like a man named Thomas Münzer was suggesting, then, um, then we're always uncertain. Then we're dependent on our own feelings. And so Luther, whose own feelings often brought him to despair, wanted to be able to look to the sure and certain word of God, to the promise we have in, in absolution from another Christian, especially from our pastor, um, to, the, to the forgiveness of sins that our baptism has promised us forever and ever, to the uh, absolution that the Lord's Supper gives us as we regularly receive Christ's body and blood. So... In, um, in the eighth article of this third section, Luther talks about confession and absolution of sin, but then nails down the fact that we can be certain because we have this promise of God outside us in the various forms of his word. Then he goes on briefly to touch on excommunication. There had been two forms of excommunication, not only the, the barring from the altar of Christ, that uh, the medieval church practiced, but also the so-called greater uh, excommunication, which the church, together with secular authorities, could place upon a person who had committed great sin so that they simply would be um, banned from society as well as the church. And Luther thought that was an abuse and uh, thought that, that the church should simply be uh, 
uh, doing its own spiritual uh, duties and, and calling people to repentance through excommunication, uh, through the reminder that they are um, deeply embedded in sin and refuse to repent. And so the ninth article of this section um, focuses on, on that uh, discipline that the church practices with its people. There are other church uh, usages or customs that, uh, that Luther then goes on to discuss. And the next uh, two uh, revolve around the pastoral office itself. The first insists that uh, the proper bishop uh, is a bishop who ordains men to uh, preach the word of God in its truth and purity, to administer the sacraments uh, correctly according to the institution of Christ. This was really a call for the council to discuss the question of whether Lutherans could be ordained by the papal bishops. And Luther said, if we are to live under uh, a, a the jurisdiction of such bishops, then they must be ready to ordain people who will minister the gospel instead of serve the interests of the pope and, and uh, be enslaved by the customs of the medieval church. And one of those customs was uh, the practice of clerical celibacy, that is the prohibition that priests could be married. And Luther uh, said that this is an anti-Christian, tyrannical, wicked practice uh, because it, it goes against the doctrine of creation because it, it, uh, it denies the goodness of God's gift of sexuality and marriage. And so um, he thinks that the council should discuss that and obviously that the council should permit uh, the marriage of priests. After he deals with these abuses uh, concerning pastors or priests, he goes on to discuss what other articles. Well, uh, next he defines the church. Um, that was a major issue uh, both for Roman Catholics who really saw the issue of the church defined as those subject to the Bishop of Rome as the vicar of Christ on earth, whereas the Lutherans saw the church, well, let me read. Luther said that the church is a concept so simple that a seven-year-old child can grasp it. The church is simply not involved with obedience to any bishop. The church is holy believers, the little sheep who hear the voice of their shepherd. So even children can pray, I believe in one holy Christian church. What Luther is saying is that the church consists of those whom God calls by the word and to whom he gives the gift of faith. This is really not any different than Melanchthon's definition of the church as uh, that place where God has the gospel proclaimed in its truth and purity and the sacraments rightly administered. Um, so the, the church is simply defined as the faithful people of God gathered around what Lutherans uh, learned to call the means of grace, that is his word in its oral and written and sacramental forms. From that definition of the church, Luther then goes on to revisit a definition of what it means to be a believer. And he says simply, to be a believer is to live by faith. As uh, St. Peter says um, in Acts 15 verse 9, and as uh, we receive a new, clean, different heart for the sake of Christ. In that faith and in that uh, life that God has determined through the Holy Spirit on the basis of Christ's death and resurrection. We are, in his sight, righteous and holy. And in the sight of our fellow human beings, we produce good works. We experience the renewal of the Holy Spirit. The forgiveness of sins means that we practice new obedience. And Luther wants to make that point very clear. He makes that point very clear also by saying that means that monastic vows are not a way to be more God-pleasing than um, Christians in the practice of their daily vocation. Indeed, what um, Luther says is that we should be practicing our daily uh, callings from God as we 
reviewed them in the small catechism, for instance, so that we can uh, come into his presence uh, with works that are pleasing to him, not on the basis of our own merit, not on the basis of our own performance, but because they are done by people of faith. And finally, the last of these articles concern human regulations. And there we get back to a point that we remember Melanchthon made clearly in the Augsburg Confession that Luther also made in his discussing the church. The church is not a holy Christian church because uh, of any kind of ceremony. He says the holiness of the church doesn't consist of surpluses, tonsures, long albs, or other ceremonies. It consists in the word of God and in true faith. And so in this final article, Luther repeats that, reinforces that, and says that human regulations can in no way attain forgiveness of sins or merit salvation. It is not a mortal sin, as the medieval church taught, to break these regulations. So what he is saying is, again, as Melanchthon said in the Augsburg Confession, Article 15, the ceremonies, the rites, the usages, the, the customs of the church are indeed valuable as teaching tools, as aids to the proclamation of the word of God, uh, but in themselves their practice does not define the church, does not define the absence of the church if they're not practiced, doesn't define the presence of the church if they are practiced. Um, instead, they are simply servants of, the, of, of God and of the gospel. And then he goes on to list a number of um, what he calls foolish and childish articles um, again, mostly customs such as baptizing bells and consecrating candles or spices or cakes, uh, which he says uh, simply are wrong and simply should not be taken seriously, should be banned from the church of God. So that's the, the way he uh, lays out an agenda for council that, as you said, uh, really forms a kind of last will and testament uh, stating once again clearly the, an outline of what he believed. Given these two purposes for the small card articles, they really do provide us with a nice summary of the Christian faith, or to put it as my colleague Dr. Kolb has written, the small card articles provide us with a very helpful model for confessing the faith within the public square.